The Command and Color system is a game system that has been very popular in the last couple of years. I don't think it really uh, needs much of an introduction from Command and Colors, Ancients, Napoleonics, Memoir 44. Uh, there definitely are many and popular games that came out around that core system created by Richard Borg. Now we have a new game in the system which covers a topic that we had not seen before in Commands and Colors. And frankly one that never even crossed my mind there could be a game based on this system um, about this topic. The topic is the Great War, World War I. That is, by Richard Borg, uh, the trenches of the First World War, when they still called it the Great War, uh, the rains, the storms of steel that Junger wrote about, all of these in this game uh, captured through the commands and color system. Does it work? Does it not? Let's take a closer look and then we'll talk about that in the conclusions for my video. Combat units in this game are represented by plastic soldiers that, and when you open the box for the first time, will be on this plastic sprue and as you can see they all come in a single piece there are only some of them actually like machine guns and mortars that need to be assembled infantry soldiers and bombers are simply represented by individual figurines that you simply have to cut out of the sprue now this being said uh, as you can see i have prepared the uh, english for playing but not the Germans, because I had some unpleasant experience with the uh, with the uh, English. Uh, it's probably just me, I'm really not good at manual things, even simple ones. Um, and I tried to cut out uh, the figurines using an exact knife, and that didn't go too well, so I tried very small and thin scissors. Uh, still I had a problem, because sometimes as I would cut out a figurine, uh, uh, part of the rifle would fall off, will remain attached to the to the sprue, or simply fall off. The vibration would, would detach both the uh, sometimes the arm or sometimes part of the rifle would detach it both from the sprue and the figurines. So with the British, I had a pretty sad number of people that showed up on the battlefields, uh, looking like they are carrying shotguns or simply uh, they already look like amputees which is a little sad when you think that they haven't even gone to battle yet and they're already sending people with missing limbs so after uh, spending some time with these soldiers uh, trying to turn them into functional unit i wasn't completely satisfied also they do kind of look all the same if you paint miniatures that won't be a problem but I simply thought I was simply was not excited at the idea of having a horde of these uh, brown soldiers and a horde of these gray soldiers on the board. They're also small. I don't I don't know. They didn't seem all that practical. They had to grab the entire unit because the unit is made of several of these guys in a hex. Move them around. They thought maybe they would easily fall. So what I did instead um, to simplify things, to avoid ampute more amputees, and to bring some color to the board was not to use these soldiers. And this is why these Germans are still here. But I played the game using paper soldiers, simply using paper miniatures that I found on the website Junior General, where I have a ton of paper miniatures completely for free. You download them and you build them. And then I simply assembled them, placing them on uh, plastic stands from Presses Intermedia. B R E C I S. And this is what I did. So in this video, you will see when I show the board, you will see paper units, and this is why. Not because that uh, these are the units that come with the board, but simply because these are the units that I've decided to use to play the game. I have to say, the visual effect with all these paper units standing in long lines on the board was pretty interesting and pretty, pretty nice anyways, on top of making the units quite easily identifiable and painted already as they come out of the printer. 
Here you see the board of the game. It is a mounted board. It is double sided. This side has a green background. The other one has more of a brown yellowish background. And this is where you set up your scenario. It's using terrain tiles as you can imagine and as it uh, befits the theme there are going to be a lot of trenches so I expect uh, spending some time uh, placing trenches on the on the board when you're setting up the scenario there's quite a bit of them to set up each time some scenarios also include a um, an initial shelling phase in which the terrain will show the effects of artillery hitting the no man's land before the scenario actually starts so there's a system that uh, uh, in some scenarios you will use you will roll dice and that will give you the random position of these counters here which are artillery craters that go on the board at the beginning of the game and they offer some protection to units that are moving into those hexes and they're defending uh, in those hexes. So you set up the scenario, you may add some of these craters at the beginning based on scenario instructions and then, well, you're good to go. You can start playing. There are three main types of units in the game. You have infantry, machine gun and mortar. You also have some uh, figurines to represent uh, a guy that is uh, throwing a bomb. You add that to an infantry unit and that indicates that that unit has the bomber trait. It is a trait that is now more deadly in close combat and close range combat. Units are represented by miniatures on the map and there is a number of them that indicates the unit of full strength. The number of miniatures to indicate that at the beginning of the game is 4. As the unit takes hits you remove figurines until a unit doesn't have any anymore and at that point the unit is of course eliminated. So four types of units mainly that go on the board. You also have an off-board unit which is your reserve artillery. Uh, that doesn't go on the board, so it is simply abstracted. It is represented by a tile which has a value on it that can be uh, between 2 and 5. And simply following scenario instructions, you'll take the correct tile, correct orientation, and that shows the value of your artillery. The highest the value, the heavier the artillery is. Like in the other games in the commands and color system, you have a deck of action cards that will determine the actions that your uh, forces can take. In particular, they will indicate the type of unit, uh, the number of units that can be activated by the card that you're playing in the area in which those units are. For example, this uh, card will allow me to activate two units in the left band of the of the board that this will allow me to activate one unit on each of the three bands left center and then the right which you don't see here but it is there oh no here it is here's the right one the other cards are have different formulations so there are different instructions that allow you to activate units differently not just based on the location um, there is maybe more there may be more freedom the activation may be based on the type of unit the unit is artillery bombard that allows you to launch a particularly powerful attack with your uh, offboard artillery but the artillery can also be used uh, activated without this card simply using an order from uh, from another card that you're playing you have a hand of cards that is given to you at the beginning of the game each turn simply enough you choose a card from your hand you play it you resolve the effect usually activating units on the board and then at the end of your turn you draw another card to replenish your hand this is the basic idea an infantry unit, as represented here by my paper miniatures, uh, can activate and when activates can uh, move by zero hexes and attack or move a single hex and still conduct combat or it can move two hexes and then not launch an attack. Machine guns and mortar units can move by one or attack, not both. And as I said, units with the bomber designation act as infantry. They simply uh, fight better when they are in combat. 
moving when you move your movement may be affected by terrain there are certain types of terrain that will force you to move but usually you simply go the distance that you need to go suppose that we're like this maybe we go here we moved before now we moved enough to get there so when you activate your units you move and then you can also fight when you fight haha <laughs> when you fight there is a number of dice that you can roll and these are special dice with special symbols on them the number of dice uh, will depend on the unit that is firing and the range again you look at the player rate and it tells you uh, the number of dice that you can uh, roll based on the units and the range. For example, infantry, when attacking an adjacent enemy in close combat, so this is why it's in parentheses to remind you that, we'll roll three dice. Uh, attacking a not adjacent, so at a range of two, two dice, three or four range a single die. However, the number of dice that you roll may also be modified by terrain. For example, the first uh, turn in which you move into a forest hack, such as that one, you can attack, yes, after you move, if you move only by one, but you have a penalty of a die. You lose a die from the pool of dice that you would roll in that attack. Uh, so certain terrains are not ideal to attack from. As for uh, the terrain of the target, that is important too because it affects what hits. That is, the symbols that you see here, not all of them represent hits under all circumstances. For example, the soldier is usually a hit, but um, it can be denied by terrain. So trenches, forests, other type of terrain will allow the opponent to ignore a hit. If I'm attacking an opponent and say I had a miss, and then a soldier figure, then also the soldier figure can be absorbed by terrain. And here you have a nice terrain summary that tells you what the, how the terrain affects movement, how it may affect combat from the hex, for example forest, when you're moving on to an axe you battle at minus one die, but if you're already there there's no penalty, and then how it affects dice that are rolled against a certain unit. For example, if you're attacking a unit that is in a forest, the unit will ignore a soldier symbol from range and close combat. If you are attacking an enemy in a trench, of course that's excellent defense and it will allow to ignore two soldier symbols and two flags from range, so it's pretty tough to uh, reduce or dislodge people from a trench. If you're attacking in close combat, it's a little less terrible, but the target unit still gets to ignore a soldier symbol and a flag. So, uh, the symbols are soldier, bursts, and um, deadly symbol, skulls here. These are the symbols that may represent hits. And, uh, as I said, they may be denied by circumstances such as terrain. Also, the deadly symbol only is a hit when you are rolling in close combat, that is, from an adjacent axe, otherwise that is a miss. A unit with the bomber designation is cool because actually is able to use uh, skulls as a hit at a distance of two, not just adjacent. When they're attacking adjacent, the unit with the bomber designation gets an extra die. How about other symbols? The flag, uh, will each flag symbol forces the uh, target unit to retreat by one hex, uh, unless it has been absorbed and nulled by terrain. And when you are attacking in close combat, if for whatever reason at the end of combat the opponent is not there anymore, maybe they retreat and maybe you destroy them, you can advance after combat. Another symbol that you have is this one, super extra mega important. This is the hat quarter symbol. When you roll a hat quarter symbol from the die, uh, you gain one of these tokens here. You also receive some of them at the beginning of the game. Um, you gain them by uh, rolling those symbols on the die. There are also other ways of gaining those tokens. These are super important because that is the currency in the game. The currency that allows you to activate effects from this other deck of cards. Yes, there are two decks of cards here. The action cards that I showed you earlier that you used to 
activate units. But then you also have a second deck of cards that will generate a second hand of cards that you will keep secret from the opponent. And these cards detail a vast range of effects or things that they can do for you. But alas, they do have a cost and the cost you pay in tokens. So if I want to activate this this card here, I play from my hand whenever the effect applies based on the text that I have here. I spend one token and I resolve the effect, which in this case is you play after movement, you target all of the infantry units and a unit on a hex with wire may remove wire and still battle if eligible. Usually when you're moving onto, onto wire, uh, which is represented by terrain tiles, you have to spend your battle to remove it unless you have wire cutters. In pure logistics, hand grenade, uh, you apply to another infantry unit and draws two additional dice. Surprise ambush, totally neat. The target unit will battle first in the close combat with an additional die. Lot of different effects for a lot of different costs. Some are pretty cheap, some are super expensive. Some will allow you to counter attack, so you have to remain vigilant also during your opponent's turn. It's not just that you sit there and you just wait for the opponent to be done. You may have cards that allow you to interrupt the action of the opponent and perform actions during their turn. For example, this allows you. If your defending unit is not eliminated or forced to retreat during close combat, then you may battle back with an additional die against the unit that just attacked you. Lot of different effects. There's also a card for Matahari, um, which I can't find now, but hey, it's there. You know, take my word from it. I promise it is. So this adds a lot to the game because you have an entire second level of decisions that you need to integrate in your uh, plans uh, together with, of course, the decisions that you have to make when you're handing, when you're handling your hand of action cards. Maybe you will spend a lot of headquarter tokens on a single powerful card. So maybe you will save the tokens for later, waiting for better cards. You will spend tokens dividing the effects among uh, lower cost cards. A lot of different things are added to the game because of this. And as I said, artillery is also a factor here. Uh, artillery can be launched by small, um, by, by mortars on the board, but the main uh, effect of artillery when it's really nasty comes from this uh, off-board artillery here. You activate it, and this indicates the number of, uh, of headquarter tokens that you can spend. You can spend here up to five such tokens. Each token that you spend up to the maximum printed on the tile of the artillery unit allows you to roll a die for the artillery attack. You designate the target hex, which may be anywhere on the board. You place this template here on the target hex. Suppose that for whatever crazy reason I want to put it here. It's just to show you how it works. Then you have a set of dice, which are numerical dice, not special dice. And you roll the a number of dice corresponding to the number of HQ uh, tokens that you're spending. I spent four of those green tokens, then I roll four dice. The number indicates the hexes that will be attacked. As you can see, this is the template. It has numbers around that indicate specific uh, uh, hex sites. So for example, I have a two goes on this one. Four is there. So I place the dice there and then six. These are the actual hexes that will be hit. However, each time that I, and, and you're thinking, well, so you can hit anywhere but where you place a target uh, template, not exactly. Each time that you roll a double, you also get to roll the same amount of dice for the target hex. So in this case, I also roll two dice uh, as an attack on the target hex. Those dice are called uh, on target, and there are game effects that apply to on target dice, on target hits. Uh, had I rolled more doubles, then more numbers, more dice would have been here. Suppose that I also had rolled two twos, then there would be two dice here showing two, and there would be a total of four dice on, on target. 
two because of those two are a match and two because of these two also are a match because they're double. Then once you have the number of dice that will fall in each hex, you simply roll the corresponding dice and you resolve the artillery attack. So it can be pretty powerful or completely useless. It is definitely pretty unreliable and inaccurate, which I think uh, captures the spirit of heavy artillery uh, during World War One. And these are the main ideas behind the game. There are a lot of scenarios that you can play. Victory conditions are based usually on victory points that you gain by eliminating enemy units and or by uh, taking control and retaining control of specific locations on the board, locations that are particularly valuable based on the scenario instructions. World War I is fascinating, of course, he's historically incredible, but for some whatever reason it's not one of my favorite periods when it comes to gaming. Uh, I love learning about it and I know the importance, of course. The games about it somehow they're not all that attracted to me. Interesting enough, then when I play them I like them, but somehow I'm more drawn into trying games about other topics, especially World War II. Uh, but this one was a pleasant surprise. Now in Commands and Colors games, sometimes the complexity, the nuances uh, come from the units that you have. In Napoleonics, a lot of different units that move in different ways, retreat in different ways, attack in different ways, and so on and so forth. It captures a lot of variety of the army and possible variety of action through that. Here, as I think it should be with a game um, on this topic, the units are more homogeneous. You don't have many types of units, you have a ton of infantry units that all mm, behave exactly the same, uh, which makes perfect sense when it really gives me the sense of this uh, faceless masses that the states were uh, accumulating, were gathering in the trenches to then push them over the top they get exterminated, repeat that. The idea of interchangeable infantry units that you could move from one side of the front to another um, makes perfect sense, of course, when we're talking about World War One. But what really matters here is terrain. So uh, it's not, say, like in Napoleonics where you have a lot of different units, the same in Ancients, uh, of the commands and color system and then terrain is kind of like a more basic you have a lot of effects based on terrain here but i feel that here terrain is even more uh important as it should be when we're talking about trenches you may just jump from the worst possible x in which you are which you may be in the game which is a clear x anything and everything can hit you and destroy you and you can jump from there into a trench where all of a sudden you have a phenomenal a phenomenal uh, degree of protection. Uh, the trenches as it should be really lead the overall architecture of the game, of the tactics of the players, the interaction between the players, fighting for the trenches is super important. Uh, you need to figure out ways, uh, as ideally the commands of the time we're trying to do, to coordinate infantry and artillery. The best idea is, of course, to weaken the enemy defenses with artillery, and when those are weakened, then you move in with your infantry, take control of the trenches, and voila, ta-da! Um, which is what you would like to do, what textbooks tell you you should do, and of course, as in real life, it doesn't always happen the way. So, um, it really captures this, the problems and the challenges uh, and advantages that come from the uh, trench fighting, the defensive advantages and the coordination and timing that is needed to be able to take a trench of the opponent. This being said, going over the top and running against the opponent can be pretty punitive, can be pretty devastating. If anything, I had the impression maybe a little less here, a uh, little less gruesome, you have better chances of getting to the other side of the trench without protection than it would have happened historically, but that's a minor thing and actually it may just be a subjective impression of mine.
but I really like how the terrain and the weapons interact to create that sort of World War I uh, feel and system of challenges with a game that remains incredibly playable, understandable, intuitive, precisely like uh, we have learned to expect from the commands and color system. I think this is an implementation that is both thematically and, and rich and exciting and engaging in terms of gameplay. The deck of combat cards, uh, uh, the, the, the one that determines special effects that you need to fuel with the headquarter tokens, that's a great thing, it allows you a little more control, still depends on the cards that you have, but you have two hands of cards, you have more control, also more hand management, more resource management, um, more challenges of course but more opportunities if you do manage to uh, manage your hand hands of cards well more chrome more richness that comes from all the effects uh, that those other cards can determine the possibility for some easy easily effective and mean surprise when you're playing a certain tricky effect on the opponent disrupting uh, the operations of the opponent the elements uh, of the game work very well. And having two full decks of cards, two hands of cards, again, that worried me in abstract terms, in reality. That just added so much flavor and so much uh, excitement to gameplay that I really love it. I really love the, the, that, that element. There's another subtle thing about the way in which you achieve headquarter tokens that you need for your... Um, for your units. Uh, those are the ways of, of getting tokens, for example, by um, not getting new cards, you get new tokens. But the main source is pretty much uh, the dice, what you roll. Now, the dice that you roll in combat, the uh, H quarter token icon is a miss in combat. So you put together a great combat and you roll a lot of those, so actually all of a sudden you find yourself stuck just outside of the trench of an opponent, your opponent is still in the trench, you are still outside, and all of those headquarter tokens in the present combat meant misses, so the opponent is still there uh, able to fire back at you. On the other hand, those misses did give you something, which is a resource that you may be able to use later. There's a fine and nice balancing mechanism there uh, that makes it such that if you roll poorly during your attacks, so sometimes you roll poorly and you don't get anything, but there is still a chance that actually you're getting some resources, you're getting a consolation prize. The defeating that specific attack teaches you something you learn from experience, so you gain HQ quarters that abstractly represent other command resources that you're accumulating as you're seeing uh, things develop on the on the battlefield. I definitely like that. Um, I love it. I love it. It has all of the advantages, great things of the commands and color system, which is a simple, accessible, a lot of surprises, a lot of fun moments that come from the uh, card elements. It feels thematic, the uh, scenarios are very different from one another, I did not expect this, they just play in different ways, uh, thanks to the terrain. There's replay value just coming out of the fact that in some scenarios you have a pre-game shelling in which you place those craters, and that can be done in different ways in different games, the map may look uh, considerably different from one time that you play the game to another, even when you're playing the same scenario a lot of variety and just a lot of narrative. I like games that tell me a story and, and, the, and the games in the comments and color system do that and this one absolutely fits the bill. It's a worthy addition to that family. I love it. I simply was excited as I was playing the game much more than I expected between uh, trying pushes uh, over the top, organizing desperate defense, uh, fights between different uh, um, uh, parts of the trench, rain of artillery on various parts of the board, sometimes a little too close to my people. A lot went on, a great story developed each time that I played the game, each scenario that I played. I love it. I'm gonna point uh, maybe to one or two very minor negatives, if nothing else, so that you see that I 
they take a close look at the design. I'm not just um, showing some unrestrained, naive excitement. Maybe it is, but I was able to pick up one or two things. I thought, ah, oh, maybe, maybe. One is um, uh, setup time. It takes quite a while to set up a scenario, longer than in my experience any other of the commands and colors game games. Just because you have a lot of terrain, and you have a lot of those trench axes that have a straight line of trench on one side and something more complicated, some intersection, some curve on the other side. So as you start putting them down, sometimes when you use almost all of them, you realize that you are missing, say, a curved section which must be on the back of one of the axes that you already put down. So you have to go back and look for them. If we had more axes than strictly needed, the game would be more, um, more expensive probably, but it would take much less time to set up because you would be able to separate your uh, hex tiles, uh, especially the ones with the trenches. Meaning it's just the terrain tiles in ways that you do not have to do a lot of double flipping or planning ahead. Okay, this one has a curve, should I save it? Will I need it later? I don't want to have to go through that process again. So between the fact that sometimes you have to redo things as you set up the game, and in any case, it, there are a lot of terrain access to put on the board. It takes a little longer to, to set up than other games. Then you have so much fun that you forget about that little extra chore that you had to uh, take care of right there, but it's an aspect of the game. If you're two players, of course, that simplifies things, but it's a very minor aspect, and then when you play the game, it's so much fun that who cares about the setup. Other very minor thing is the rulebook. It does a decent job, more than decent, um, at explaining the rules. It could use an index. It doesn't have an index, and the various titles of the various sections don't really stand out much. It's a, they're printed in red, but they are not. They don't stand out from the background all that much. So when you're looking for a specific paragraph, um, flipping through the pages, so sometimes it did take me a little longer to retrieve information, double check information, a little longer than I would have liked. Minor, minor, minor things. So frankly, I pointed, and I pointed them out just to be accurate. The lack factor, some people will see it as a minus, but those people already know that comments and colors uh, games have that large element. I love it. I love that degree of random element. Um, reminds me of Clausewitz and the deal of war is a game of cards as a range of opportunities that come and go and you need to grab them and to use them at the best of your possibilities when the time comes. So for some people, the cards, the large fa luck factor is a minus to me. It isn't. Very minor things uh, on the negative side, very, very big substantial things on the side of the pros, of the, on the positive side. Frankly, I love this game. Together with Napoleonics, this is easy, easily my uh, favorite commands and colors game so far. Overall, let me state it as clearly as I can. To me, this game is a 10. Full 10.